morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. My name is Lisa Stromquist, and I'm the National Coordinator for Quality and Patient Safety Programs at um, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers. And as part of um, our patient safety program, uh, the CAFC Patient Safety Collaborative hosts um, monthly webinars and presentations on the fourth Friday of every month. Um, and that uh, uh, recorded presentation will be posted on uh, the uh, CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network. And everybody will receive uh, a link uh, for that um, in an announcement um, in, the, in the next few days or so. So during the question and answer uh, session, at the end of the presentation, I had asked that you write your questions in the control panel, there is a question pane in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. So I'd really encourage you to just write those questions in as you think of them during the presentation. And uh, once the once the speakers are done, um, the, the, they will answer those questions for you. And uh, again, um, welcome everybody. And right now I'm going to hand the, the microphone over to Darlene Bolivar who is the co-chair of CAFC's Patient Safety Collaborative, and she'll introduce uh, today's topic and all of our speakers. Good morning, and welcome, everybody, to the Collaborative. As Lisa said, um, my name is Darlene Bolivar, and I'm at the IWK Health Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I co-chair this monthly collaborative with um, Tracy Rong, who is at uh, CHEO in Ottawa, and unfortunately Tracy can't be on the line with us today, um, so I'm going to fly solo. And I do have to declare that even though I'm uh, chairing the meeting today, I'm also going to be uh, one of the just introductory presenters. Um, because our topic today is around family leadership council and how patient and family-centered care and family leadership uh, councils can contribute to a broader patient safety. And the presentation today is coming from my office in uh, Halifax. So I did just want to let folks know that I will be having a, a dual role here today. As Lisa said, we uh, meet every month um, at this time, so whatever time it is in your time zone. And we're an open membership, so anyone who wants to jump on the line with us, we're happy to have you. And our next meeting will be December the 20th um, at 11 to 12 um, Ottawa time. So without further ado, I think we will uh, jump into our presentation. And uh, we will have, um, in addition to my introductory remarks, Remarks. We will have uh, three family members who are members of our Family Leadership Council um, and our physician rep as well to, to overview uh, some of our opportunities that we've had here at the IWK. And there will be lots of time, as Lisa said, for question and answers at, um, at the end. Uh, so we hope to make this really interactive. And feel free to ask us anything you want at the end of the presentation. So. Um, the presentation is on uh, Family Leadership Council and Patient and Family-Centered Care um, using the IWK here in Halifax as, as one example of this. So um, <coughs> we've got really just three learning objectives for the purpose of today to provide a bit of an introduction to the Family Leadership Council as it exists here within the IWK to provide an overview of the concepts of patient and family-centered care that we've built our Family Leadership Council on here at the IWK, and to help you gain an understanding of how patient and family-centered care contributes to patient safety and improved outcomes. Uh, so uh, again, those are the three we'll be working from today. I'm not sure about this, but uh, so our family leadership, uh, so the, the, the presenters for today, as I said, will be um, myself just doing a bit of an introductory and setting the stage for where we've come and what we've done here. Uh, we have a family member, Catherine Gunn, uh, who is uh, actually the co-chair of the Family Leadership Council now. We have on the line at a different site from us, Susan Butts, who's a family advisor. Um, and is a member who comes via telehealth from our from 
a family leadership council. We have uh, Yero Gillis, who is another uh, family member, and just actually this week ended her term as uh, the co-chair of our family leadership council. And we have Dr. Alfred Larson, who's the division head of our general pediatric medicine department, and she is a member and a physician rep of our family leadership uh, council. Uh, so that's who you see there on the screen today. We do have a dedicated email uh, number or an email address for anyone who wants to provide us with information or ask us questions, and you can see that there on the screen as well. So um, who are we and what do we do? So uh, again, we have over 10 family or, or ex-patient members. Um, who are advisors and we that are dedicated to the Family Leadership Council, and we meet on a monthly basis uh, with uh, various uh, staff. There are usually about uh, myself, uh, the vice president of organizational performance, and the manager of uh, the housekeeping department, who are, are the core members of staff that these families meet with, as well as Dr. Larson is our um, medical advisor on that group as well, and interested and very participative. So uh, what we strive to do is to provide consultation and input into the various projects and programs that are happening within the IWK. So we would like to say that uh, decisions are made uh, that impact patients and families with patients and families. We have um, built, there, there's four key concepts of patient and family-centered care that we've built our, our, our council on. And I think they're pretty common in every family advisory council, probably has the same across the country. Dignity and respect, information sharing, participation, and collaboration. Within those core concepts, we have um, overlaid five pillars for patient and family, uh, the, pa the Family Leadership Council. I know other organizations probably call it a Family Advisory Council, but our FLC refers to the Family Leadership Council. And those five pillars are patient safety, staff education, family information, our operations and support groups, um, and our facilities group, so facilities design, signage, those kind of things. So that's where we strive to have impact um, and touch all areas within the organization. Uh, we do produce a uh, kind of a year in review. This isn't pretty here on this slide, but it gives you a snapshot of some of the things that the Family Leadership Council did over the last 2012-13 year. And our year runs usually from September till June. And we normally meet about nine times. Uh, in this year that's reflected here, we only had an opportunity to meet on seven times due to some snow uh, storms. We do a fair number of health center consultations. And you can see some of them here. We had a, a code of conduct policy. Uh, the mental health and addictions program was redesigning their website and wanted input. Uh, protection services desk, making it more welcoming and less like a protection services desk, you know, formula feedings, et cetera. You can see them there. We've uh, been asked to be involved in the health center reviews. And these are joint academic appointment and administrative reviews. And we did four of those with a number upcoming as well. So they, uh, when the reviews happen, it's a joint review between the hospital and the division department at the university. And so they always want to have uh, patient and family input into that. Uh, we've provided feedback and input on various requests. And the difference between feedback or in input and a consult is a consult is a kind of a formal consult where the presenter provides information and comes and addresses the issue um, at the council and hears firsthand feedback, whereas input is we can do that through uh, an email distribution list, which we have set up. Uh, we have um, representation on various health center committees, as you can see there. And those are standing committees. We have patient and family um, uh, patient and family center care opportunities on uh, general orientation. So we are always involved in that as well. And one of the things we did um, early on in the Family Leadership Council uh, is we developed an award of excellence in patient and family centered care. And as you can see, um, in each year that we gave it out, and we did not design it this way, 
it um, organically became this way is we've given out an individual award and we've given out a team award. And so the awards um, are associated with our annual general meeting and other awards that are given out by our board of directors. So um, it's fairly high profile there. And the award really is uh, a piece of children's artwork that's framed um, and then the nomination letter that goes with it. So in this year, you can see our therapeutic clown. Um, got the individual award, and on the bottom, um, it was the, our reproductive mental health team, and uh, Catherine is there with, as a co-chair presenting that award. She just happened to be a nominee that year. So we distribute the invitations to award, present a, or to nominate somebody through social media as well as around the organization, and that is open to the public and anybody that's used our services over the past year here. So that's. Uh, fairly special, and the people that receive those uh, feel fairly honored. And then you can see some of our other accomplishments that have been led by our Family Leadership Council over the past year as well. So that really is just kind of to set the stage over the work that we have done. Um, and as I said, we have five pillars of FLC. And um, we've tried to present slices of people's stories and set them within those pillars so that you can get a, an idea of how, how the work that we do within in the IWK really can affect some of these pillars. So I'm now going to turn it over to Catherine Gunn. So my story um, does fall a little bit under the operations side of it, but also there's a whole bunch of um, information sharing and things um, that went along with it. Um, it began in obstetrics, uh, and I was admitted for a high-risk pregnancy in 2009, in the fall of 2009. Uh, it was actually my fourth high-risk pregnancy, and uh, in this one I was diagnosed with vasa previa. And I arrived in the middle of the night um, and was separated from my 20-month-old son at home. At the time, I was 23 weeks pregnant, and uh, it was decided that I would stay until we hopefully had a successful delivery. Uh, so we had a great care team that was really instrumental in creating the partnership that included my uh, husband and son in many ways. Um, and one of those, I think, uh, probably involved our neonatologist. We knew that we'd be having a preterm delivery, and so we met uh, with the neonatologist. And I distinctly remember her sitting with me and waiting for my husband to arrive so that we could walk through that NICU experience together. Uh, she took the time to go over what was going to happen in the first 24 hours. And we were encouraged to ask a lot of questions so that we could better prepare ourselves. And we were allowed to do this together. And it really did make a difference um, on that first 24 hours when our daughter was born. Um, our team also made every effort to include my son. Um, he was there every day after daycare and on weekends. He often would stay for dinner and stay overnight. And that sort of allowed our family to maintain some sort of normal life when I was unable uh, to leave the health center and participate in his care. So they often started out as fairly rowdy nights. And uh, by the end, he was in my bed, and I was usually on the cot. So um, he had a great time, and that was sort of his easy way to adjust to what was going on. A few weeks after I was admitted, um, H1N1 hit the province in full force. And in an attempt to reduce the risk to patients, uh, the hospital created a policy that limited patients to two predetermined visitors and no visitors under the age of 12. So while this policy was intended to protect patients, um, it really did deal a significant blow to our family and other families. And so without any other relatives, I was cut off from my husband and my son, and he was the sole caregiver. So while this was intended to make things safer for patients, it did put a significant amount of stress on an already stressful pregnancy. So fortunately, we were able to work with our team and reproductive mental health and some department managers. And we did, after a few days, work out some scenarios that allowed some compromised visitation. Um, so there were no more overnight visits, but we did uh, remain as a family as much as we could over the next week or a few weeks that followed. Um, in early December, H1N1 was on the decline, and um, I delivered at 32 weeks gestation, um, a 3-pound, 11-ounce baby girl. Uh, 
I transitioned home first, and then my husband and I came back and forth to look after our little baby. Uh, we participated in every aspect of her care, um, as frightening as it was. From the very beginning, I was involved in changing her and bathing her. Um, I remember my husband saying he would change her once the diapers became large enough to buy in a store. And uh, I learned how to replace those ECG leads after the bath, and I was paranoid that they weren't in the right spot, but we did figure it out. And uh, I had to switch her oximeter back and forth and really look after things that I didn't ever anticipate that I would. Um, and I remember thinking, there's no way I can do this. I don't even want to hold her. I, she's way too small. But we were part of every single aspect, and the nursing team really shared a lot of the information with us that allowed us to help and to do this. Uh, we were part of daily rounds, so we sat at the bedside um, as the team came through, and we were encouraged to ask a lot of questions. Uh, a lot of our questions around feeding strategies and lipids uh, were answered there with input from a lot of the team members. And we were allowed to ask pretty much anything that we wanted. Uh, I also remember that we were given a lot of decision-making power. Um, one of those decisions was to stop putting the IV lines in her legs, arms, feet, and eventually her head, and put a central line in instead. We were given the information and allowed to decide. And initially, I was really reluctant about the central line. And I kept putting it off and saying, no, more IVs was OK. Uh, but when the line was put in, it was ultimately our decision. And if they were annoyed that I made this decision at 11 o'clock at night, they never showed it. Um, some of the other examples of, about the care involved our son. Uh, while I was at the hospital, as much as I could possibly be the team that was looking after our baby also realized that I had a child less than two at home and that we had been separated for two months. More than once, they reminded me that I could go home and be a mom to him, too. Uh, another was in regards to visitation. We did ask the NICU staff after our daughter was born when he could meet with his sister. And um, they told us the decision was up to us. It really didn't matter. Uh, we decided ultimately that. He was very young, and we knew he was excited, but we also knew that she had a lot of lines um, in her, and there was a lot of things running back and forth. So we decided that we would wait until most of her lines were removed, because we did know that her prognosis was fairly good. So we eventually, on uh, Christmas morning, we decided that that was the time he was going to meet his sister for the first time. And he was beyond excited. Um, he got his own chair in the NICU to hold her. And uh, we were just so excited about um, how everything turned out and uh, how involved we were in her care. So this is Christmas Day um, 2009. And she's grown. She's done uh, very, very well. And uh, this was taken this summer. And she's uh, turning four in uh, a couple of weeks. So she's done um, very well overall. So I was going to hand it over to Yarrow, but uh, Yarrow's not available right now. So what I will do is I'll advance this through um, just to Susan so that Susan can take over. And Susan's actually joining uh, from another office. And uh, we'll let Susan tell part of her story. My name is Susan Butts, and I'm a patient family representative on the Hematology Oncology Interprofessional Committee, known as HOIC at the IWK, plus a member of the Family Leadership Council. My story is also around 2009, 2010. My daughter, Jennifer, next slide, please, was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma nine years ago. When she was first diagnosed, someone told us that there was approximately an 80% cure rate, and that if you had to have cancer, that was a better type to have. Even though there's an 80%, or at that time there was an 80% cure rate, Jennifer was one of the 20% that was not cured. She had six years of chemo, radiation, and two bone marrow transplants. Throughout it all, she smiled and made the best of everything. This is a picture of Jennifer with the Olympic gold medal curling team. Jennifer graduated from grade 12 at the top of her class and was a class valedictorian. She started her first year at Dalhousie with hopes of studying medicine. This was the fall of 2009, the fall of H1N1. 
Jennifer developed H1N1 in November of that year and basically spent the next eight months at the IWK. Christmas of that year, one of her best friends gave her a picture with a collage of Jennifer and her friends for the past 18 years. Jennifer spent Christmas in the hospital that year. She had the collage in her room. We didn't travel very lightly. When, we, when Jennifer was admitted, we had a lot of things from home in her room. So this was one of the things that we took along with us. One day after Christmas, one of the oncologists was doing rounds and commented on the collage, especially the picture of the girls with their beautiful prom dresses. Jennifer said, as we all do after spending so much money on ball gowns, is, what was the point? No one ever wears a graduation of gowns again. The oncologist said, oh my heavens, we need to plan a New Year's Eve gala. So within the next three days, we had three of Jennifer's friends come from Port Hawkesbury, which is three hours away, for New Year's Eve, complete with their ball gowns. Ball gowns and suits for the parents on the unit and fancy dresses for the patients. The oncologist brought in her one of her ball gowns that I was able to wear um, on the event, and my husband was able to scrape together a tie. Um, the playroom was decorated, and corsages made from tissue paper, chocolate fountain, and snacks planned. Music, even a sparkly ball, which stopped at midnight. Because there were some smaller children, we actually had two midnights, one at nine, and then one again at the actual midnight for the older children. Many physicians, nurses, and staff came in to spend their New Year's Eve with us. The, some of the ward clerks came in to do makeup, and physicians and nurses came in for entertainment, a little dance, um, to do that chocolate fountain serve punch. It was a really in, fun evening. When thinking of the core concepts of patient family-centered care, this magical evening demonstrates respect and dignity for patients and their families during such a difficult time. And it gave us such a wonderful memories of our last New Year's Eve together as Jennifer passed away in June, the following June. Oh, and that's us at New Year's Eve. Thank you. Hello, Hello I'm uh, Alfred Larson, and um, I get the um, somewhat sad task of following those lovely stories with some um, data and evidence. Um, so I'm just going to go back uh, first to just kind of questions I've uh, looked at, um, starting with the definition of family-centered care, uh, which I'll look at again, and then looking at whether or not it's effective and for what uh, kind of outcomes. And of course, for particularly for this particular forum, I've uh, redone this a bit to focus a little more on the safety outcomes. So. Um, to look at the evidence, we kind of need to see how we're defining it. And when we go back to those four concepts, I think the third one is the key in many ways. Hopefully, dignity and respect and information sharing are actually part of any good quality patient care. Obviously, there's more focus on those with family-centered care. Collaboration tends to be more about the institution and how it uh, deals uh, with families in terms of participation in policies and procedures and so on. So if we're defining family-centered care for purposes of a research program uh, to look at its effectiveness, it's really the participation piece. And in fact, when you go to the literature, you find that, uh, depending on where you look, that people are actually defining it by whether they see a family provider partnership or shared decision making, again, depending somewhat on the uh, source. So even within that, it's still hard to define for research. So a lot of researchers look at very broad interventions, and if they do get outcome changes, well, how much is that related to family-centered care and how much to other aspects? If it is from family-centered care, which are the important aspects? On the other hand, if you look at narrow interventions, you may have an intervention that's in fact too narrow to be effective, so you may get false um, negative results. Um, so I'm just going to look at an awful lot of research I could look at, but I'm just going to look at a um, systematic review that was done in 2010, which used family provider partnership as a key definition. Um, and they looked at uh, 24 studies out of a very large number that were screened, and particularly focusing on some randomized trials. And there were a range of conditions, as you can see there on the slides. Uh, many had multiple chronic needs, uh, six had asthma, and then there were other uh, specific chronic conditions that were looked at. 
And again, they noticed that there were positive outcomes. They didn't look at safety specifically, but they did uh, look at a range of health outcomes, some of which were safety related, and efficiency, satisfaction, access of care, communication, and systems of care were found to have positive outcomes, although none of these outcomes were found to be consistently positive across all of the studies. A Cochrane review that looked at family-centered care for hospitalized children and excluding neonates found that there was some limited evidence for benefits of family-centered care uh, for a range of outcomes, but felt that this was still uh, somewhat preliminary because it was a small data set. Uh, and specifically, and this was also noted in the other review, uh, there were no studies that were identified where there were any negative effects of family-centered care. And I think that's an important concept because people who resist it will often cite um, potential negatives that have not been found in good evidence. So out of that Cochrane review, I've actually uh, decided to give you a little more detail about there was only one good quality randomized trial, and it's a non-published PhD thesis. And in this study, 288 children who were post-tonsillectomy were randomized to be cared for in what they actually called a care-by-parent unit, or standard care. And they defined, um, as one of their outcomes, inadequate medical care. So those were children who had one of the following, um, the poor control of either pain or of nausea and vomiting, some delay in getting needed medical attention that was more than 30 minutes, if they weren't discharged by noon on their first day post-op, and whether they needed a medical consultation within seven days of discharge. So clearly, some of those are safety-related, particularly delays in getting medical attention and needing a medical consultation. So the, this inadequate medical care was significantly improved. People were more likely to have adequate care in the care-by-parent unit group, and delay in discharge was particularly strongly associated. And there are a number of other measures, including cost of care and family satisfaction, that were improved, and again, no negative outcomes. I'm going to switch a little bit to the uh, neonatal intensive care unit environment, because in fact some of the strongest evidence comes from that environment. And in some of the literature, at least, they're tending to use the phrase family integrated care. And really what that seems to be to me is family-centered care sort of pushed to the maximum. Um, and in this concept, parents are actually providing all of the care to their child apart from IVs and medication. And the nursing role, um, instead of being traditionally as the main care provider with the family uh, participating somewhat passively, the nurses become coaches and educators for the parents who are the active caregivers, uh, apart from those limited things. So um, again, in, in this care, the parents are providing all that care. Um, I think I have two trials here, some repetition. Sorry for that. Um, and there's a randomized trial, which is a pilot, of 42 mother-infant pairs. And these were preemie infants who were still quite unwell, but were not in needing um, intensive inhalation. Sometimes they were on um, CPAP. Uh, and this is just a press release from the, uh, when the study of this pilot was published. And this is the first uh, baby. And you can see the baby is, in fact, getting some respiratory support there with nasal CPAP, but is, uh, is not on a ventilator with a rate. So they found significantly improved weight gain in the family integrated care group of infants after they adjusted for various risk factors. There were significantly increased rates of breastfeeding on discharge, and that's a huge improvement from 45% to 82%. And we know that breastfeeding is related to a number of safety outcomes that might be expected later on because of its uh, benefits in reducing infections. They found retinopathy of prematurity was significantly uh, reduced in the um, in the experimental group. And there was a reduction in nosocomial infections, which was quite impressive numerically. I think it was 0 versus 10%. Because it's a very small group, it was only of borderline significance. And parents were, were less stressed. And remember, these are parents who are being asked to take over care of very sick infants. So having reduced stress is, is a particularly positive outcome. And following this pilot, there's now a multi-center randomized trial in progress. And I understand that there are some early outcomes from that, again, looking at uh, positive patient safety outcomes. A larger study in Stockholm in family-centered care, oops, that seems to be, I, I'm missing a study from Stockholm. Um, that wasn't in my slides, I don't know quite what happened. But uh, there was a similar study in Stockholm, and that again had uh, significantly reduced lengths of stay, which in itself is a safety outcome, because safety is very, lack of safety is very much about being in the hospital. Uh, some good weight gain alternatives, and they had a reduction in a different safety outcome, which was um, 
a reduced uh, incidence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is kind of chronic lung disease that premature babies are um, subject to. So I guess my summary of all of this is that the evidence is very much still emerging, and the research in this area is challenging. And I think there's some promising early results, especially in the NICU environment. And I think it's interesting that when you do find really good quality studies that demonstrate positive patient safety outcomes, that they tend to be studies that are really pushing the envelope of family-centered care. So they're really getting parents um, not just participating in decision makings on morning rounds, for example, but very actively involved in providing the child's care. So this um, summary here is just um, kind of ties together some of the selected stories that we've shown and some of the evidence that's been presented about how these core concepts of patient and family-centered care can improve the outcomes for families. Each year, the IWK surveys patients and families about patient and family-centered care. And you can see the target is 90%. That's what we would like to have. Um, we haven't yet reached that, but all of uh, the response rates um, put it in the 80% um, and above range. So some of the things that are asked or the satisfaction uh, rates that are measured are related to patients and families being able to ask a lot of questions or encouraged to ask questions, families and patients being able to take part in decision making and receiving information in a way that they can understand. We noted that between 2012 and 2013, those results were pretty much consistent. Um, some of the small decreases we've seen have been in regards to patients and families being encouraged to take part in decision making during rounds and health center signage and directions, making it easy for patients and families to find where they need to go. Um, that was a decrease this year as well as the year before. Um, other areas that had a small decrease as well are that uh, patients and families can contact staff and ask questions or they consider families to be essential members of the team. Uh, so there are a, a variety of questions that are asked. Um, one of the things that we we looked at this year was that even though the results appear to be decreasing slightly, we're getting more and more feedback each year. So the actual target audience and the response rate is increasing significantly. So we're getting more data um, to actually include in the survey results. Uh, moving forward, I think the Family Leadership Council um, and the Family Advisors are definitely excited and passionate to share our experiences um, that will have an impact hopefully on patient safety and staff education as well as family information and operational policies. Uh, we also are encouraged in, um, at the possibility of being involved in long-range facility design. Our vision overall um, for the future would be that we would want to see family advisors and the Family Leadership Council embedded through all aspects of care um, in the health center so that we do have input on everything that's, um, that's going on. I think I'll just pass it over to Darlene to uh, sum up um, what we've spoken about today. So um, some of the things that we're planning to do is so with uh, or the future directions for our patient and, and family-centered care uh, committees are um, to look at more recruitment, more recruitment that can be core members on our Family Leadership Council, um, more recruitment for our email list so that we're drawing in a broad breadth of uh, opinion when we send it out information for opinion uh, that will help to inform our decision, and more targeted uh, recruitment. So looking at what are the needs or what are the best um, committees for patient and family input to be part of on a regular and ongoing basis so that they are at the table. And at the table can either be physically at the table via teleconference via a video conference, but be present there at the table when decisions and discussions are occurring. Um, and looking at doing uh, matching the need for the organization with the um, capacity to fill that. And right now, with our, uh, our uh, 10 to 12 family 
community leaders, we, we can't fulfill that need. So we're looking at doing some future targeted recruitment for um, looking at that as well. So those are some of the goals. Our consultations have grown by leaps and bounds. So really, we've made an impact there and inroads there in that um, every from the foundation to care design to facility design to future what we look like are really um, brought to that table by the people planning it to get input from our family stakeholders. Our website design, as I said, uh, there's, it's very much uh, front and center in people's mind from a we need input from this group of people. Um, and where we hope to grow as well is in what we're calling our family faculty. And it's uh, patients and families telling slices of their stories that have an impact in future direction. And that's why we had some stories being told here today. Uh, and in a patient and family-centered way, uh, Yarrow, who was hoping to present her story as well, is actually having care provided to one of her children today, which was the story was going to be about. So unfortunately, um, that story didn't happen. But just to sum up, uh, again, uh, the learning objectives was to just to provide you with an introduc introduction to our um, Family Leadership Council uh, to provide an overview of the concepts of our patient uh, and family-centered care and where our direction is taking us and how they're embedded into that, and then to gain an understanding through the literature of how patient and family-centered uh, care can improve outcomes. And um, because Yarrow has just entered my office and would be delighted um, for you to hear a bit of her story, I'm going to actually back up and, and let uh, Yarrow just take a few minutes and tell you her story. And then we will actually um, go through and uh, ask questions and uh, entertain questions and answers at that time. So. Um, here's Yarrow, and she is, uh, as I said, she was our first paid family leader, um, and she it was also the co-chair of our uh, Family Leadership Council until this week. So Yarrow is just running in from a medical appointment. Hi, thank you very much. Sorry, yes, this is called Patient and Family Center. Care. I was just downstairs for a dentist appointment with my daughter, which of course ran a little over. Okay, so I'm going to slow down now, because I was running around. So let's get into my session. I didn't know if I was going to have a ch chance to discuss my slides, so I'm very happy to be here. As Darlene already mentioned, I'm not quite sure of all what she mentioned. I was a family advisor here and the co-chair of the Family Leadership Council. I'm just stepping away for uh, a while to spend more time with my family. So this first slide here, which I think you might have seen briefly as it was uh, flipped over, is a, a picture of my daughter, Maya Gillis. Maya Gillis. Uh, she was born with a uh, complex congenital heart defect. Technically, uh, it's called unbalanced AVSD with coarctation of the aorta. She had her first open heart surgery at five days old. Uh, it was the, called the Norwood surgery, or perhaps that's called the bidirectional, or perhaps that's the next surgery after that. Anyway, she had the Norwood surgery at five days old, and she was fed with a feeding tube for the first year of her life. She had severe reflux and other issues as well. Right from the beginning, we learned that we, uh, we immersed ourselves into a world we did not really want to be part of, we did want, not want to know about. But we uh, have reached a point where my daughter is now seven and a half years old, doing well, doing strong, and down just in dentistry this very moment, we had our best checkup yet with her not getting upset, which is very important, very key. And that's thanks to the work being done here. What I like to mention when I show this slide is that um, some important key points are understanding and knowing that each family is individual and unique. Um, something important to consider in terms of patient family center care. It seems like a very basic concept. However, it is an important concept and sometimes it is under-recognized. This is a, a picture of her as well. Um, not quite post Norwood surgery. Uh, this is her still in the NICU and she would be coming home shortly after that. When we were having surgery, she had three open heart surgeries and they were scheduled. This is her actually post, uh, or sorry, that was her post Norwood surgery. This is her post Glenn surgery. 
For this Glenn surgery, um, my husband was working away in Alberta. So we're here in Nova Scotia. My husband's working in Alberta at this point for six weeks at a time. Our surgical team and our cardiac team, they knew um, when her surgery would need to be. They worked with us to figure out which dates were best for my husband. As, as a matter of fact, they scheduled her surgery during the first week that he was home because he was home for two weeks only and then had to turn around and head back for another six weeks of work. Well understanding that with only one parent working in the, in the household, we need to keep working. Uh, our whole life can't stop from a financial perspective because of this. Um, so this is just something that they did simply but made our lives easier. This is a photo of her here post Glenn. During her Glenn uh, or post Glenn surgery, she did develop several complications, one of which was osteomyelitis, one of which was intussusception. Intussusception occurred when a feeding tube had been inserted too far into her. And um, it had been inserted too far into her, and so she developed some symptoms. And uh, at first, it was thought to be just gas pains from recovering from surgery. But when I noted again that these did not seem to be gas pains, they seemed to be too intense, uh, lo and behold, they listened. And that day brought on a, a full day of barium testing through x-rays and the whole business. That, from my perspective as the parent, it was, was quite, the, quite the ordeal. What came from that was the fact that my nurse that day looked at what I, or looked at me, knew what I was saying, and immediately worked from what uh, I was saying. And uh, because of, because she knew that she needed to listen to the mother, she recognized that I was saying something was wrong, something is not right. The uh, the intussusception was caught earlier on than uh, if it if it had been left to go on a little bit longer. She also, let me back up here a moment, she also had uh, developed osteomyelitis and uh, we were readmitted back in for an additional six weeks during a time which my husband was not here. He was back in Alberta. And again, the uh, types of care we received here uh, were reflective of patient and family center care. And some key points that came along um, were that when we were here for six, six, eight weeks at that point, what needs to be recognized is that even that, uh, for, for a patient staying in house, is that becomes our home, that becomes our house. We are welcoming you, welcoming you in a way into our home. So little basic things like knocking before you enter, introducing yourself, which seems um, basic, but sometimes can be missed, is very important and key when you are living here at the hospital and you are um, working with this as your, your, new, your new place and you have to work with it and live with it for, for six weeks, eight weeks, eight months, depending on what's going on with your family. So just a few other notes to consider. This picture I like to show just uh, about feeding therapy. So she also worked with the feeding therapy team and uh, through extensive work with the feeding therapy team and myself, she came off to the feeding tube just prior to one year to the surprise of, of many, including myself. Again, because of the work here with the feeding therapy team um, in working with what the needs of, were of my daughter as well as the needs of my family um, were I believe, key to helping her move forward more quickly than, we, than had been expected with the feeding tube. The NG tube came out um, just two weeks prior to her first birthday. This is her in her post spontan surgery. She's recovered well for the first time. We got out in six days flat. Again, here what we experienced was uh, a lot of excellent patient family center care. They worked with the family, ourselves, our care team uh, worked with us directly to figure out what was the best surgery date that aligned with my husband's work schedule as well. Excuse me. She did develop a little bit of pleural effusion here, and that was caught quickly. Um, and they they always worked closely with us in order to ensure that the needs our needs were met as a, as a, as the family. Uh, this one here is showing the work. The work that can be done, so with uh, excellent work done here at the IWK, what you get is the result of Dr. Maya here, who wants to grow up to be a doctor, baby doctor in a rock and roll band. Uh, the reason I mention this is because she has, uh, the reason I show this is because she has been admitted multiple times through uh, emergency visits, through uh, for surgeries, for complications, 
She's had a lot of traumatic experiences. And we've had a lot of visits and checkups where things have not gone smoothly from my parent perspective in terms of her, her, um, her getting upset. To get to a point where she is happy to see her team, happy to see them, wants to be like them, exemplifies how well patient family center care has worked with our family. Here you can see her with her one of her, uh, her favorite doctors, uh, her cardiologist. When we come in now for checkups, uh, he works with us, and he works not just with myself, but he also works with Maya. Right now we're working on Maya uh, spends a lot of time telling her, her doctor about what's, what's going on, what she's feeling like. So we're working on her taking ownership of her own uh, physical health, and he works with me as well. And an example of patient family center care here that I like to mention, again, a very basic example yet is important is we were going to be changing over medication. Instead of him telling me, this is the new medication we're going to put her on, here you go, and on your way, instead it w there was a discussion uh, based on his knowledge of my background and understanding. There was a discussion about, well, the, pr the medication she's on currently shows these types of results over, uh, in this particular case, over a 24-hour period. This other type of medication might work better in her situation. So I was given the option of keeping her on the current medication switching her to a new medication, or in her case, because there's not many uh, post-Fontan children, so there's not a wide range of studies, so some, there are some indications to show that no medication would work just as well. In her particular situation, with, situation excuse me, with some prior experiences, I decided that the best case would be to switch her over to a new medication. Again, a simple task yet was done with um, our needs in mind, and it wasn't just simply assigned to us, and we weren't just directed to a new medication. It was discussed with us, with us thoroughly. And um, going forward in years to come, this will be my daughter, in fact, having these discussions. Uh, last slide, just wanted to show you. So the results of patient family center care can be simply amazing, as you can see. You can start off with the tiniest little baby uh, who's been traumatized over and over again through multiple surgeries and multiple admittances, yet you can come out with this and uh, you can change this child into someone who will grow up wanting to be, yet again, baby doctor in a rock and roll band. Thank you. Thank you. So that, um, that concludes the presentation. I'll put on my other hat of uh, chair of the collaborative, so and thank all of the folks here at the IWK for their participation. <coughs> and um, so uh, I'll throw it back to Lisa for a question and answers. And I think uh, we're all uh, going to be present. Yarrow may have to uh, step out as her baby Maya doctor is outside my door. Um, but uh, we're quite happy to entertain any questions that you'd have. So Lisa, over to you. Sure. I'll just remind everybody that if they have any questions or comments, they can type them in to the, uh, to the question pane uh, in the control panel. It should be on the right side of your screen. So we have a question from Heather. Um, how do you administer the survey to families? Okay, so I will take that one. We, um, we've done the survey five or six years running now, and each year we um, did the survey up to the last two years, we tweaked it um, till we got it um, as deep as we wanted or uh, with the breadth that we wanted. So there are some common questions that we've run every year to give us uh, you know, some good feedback year over year. But this year was the first year that we actually had the exact same survey as the previous year. And that's administered um, through our survey office and Teresa who helps um, provide support to the Family Leadership Council. And this year we um, advertised it through social media. We had over 500 responses this year. Posters are up around the building. Um, there is a web link that people can go on and click on the web link and do it online. There are paper surveys that are distributed out around. Um, they're, they're put in various ambulatory areas, and we try to vary those year after year so that we're not uh, continuing to survey the same uh, areas. This year, we targeted more of our mental health areas than were targeted in the past. And it goes out via Facebook and Twitter as well. And um, then from there, people replicate that out as well. So that's, uh, like I said, this year we had 500 and 
uh, 500 and some responses, and we do targeted mail outs as well. Uh, so that's pretty much how uh, it comes in. Then all the surveys that come in, if you uh, click on the web link and do it that way, it's automatically put into our software system. Um, and if you mail it in or do it in some other paper format, that's all entered in so that uh, the results are immediate as when the survey closes for what's in there. Great. Uh, thanks, Raleen. I, uh, I just have a question about the survey as well. I'm wondering, when you were developing and as you've been tweaking the survey questions over the years, are you getting input from the parents as, and the families as to what questions are the most important to ask? What, what they want to tell you? Are they telling you something? Have they told you something different so that you had to change your questions? As it's just... Uh, We've been, we've been working on a lot of family surveys here in the, the CAFC office as well. So, um, we we did in the beginning. That's mm -hmm. obviously where it was developed from. And then we did a post. This would have been back probably six years ago now. And then we did a little post survey survey, if you will, yep. of you know what questions were confusing, what were good. Um, not so much in the subsequent years, what we were finding was um, the reliability of the questions. Mm -hmm. So which questions were left blank or which questions weren't answered or, and because there's an open-ended piece to this mm -hmm. as well, uh, which questions were expanded upon more versus which ones were just, here's your score kind of. Um, so that what I would say about that. So in the beginning it was, not so much now. Where do the results go? The results absolutely go back to our patient, uh, our family leadership council. So we display the results there and have conversations and that helps inform what our objectives for the coming year are and where we want to target. Um, you know, certainly the communication piece, um, as I think Catherine mentioned, had, had uh, dropped off a little bit. So we engaged in, you know, a whiteboard project to help to um, aid our, um, you know, our communication techniques and provide one more avenue for patients and families to communicate with their care providers and vice versa. Uh, our, our key performance indicators, our survey results, once a year roll into our key performance indicators and are reported to our board of directors as well as publicly those KPIs are on our external website. Great. Um, I have a question here from Esther. Um, do you experience barriers from clinicians to provide family-centered care? I'll let Dr. Larson, barriers from clinicians to family-centered care. Um, Yes, uh, and I think the, uh, the barriers are largely people who think they're already doing it and aren't. So I know of physicians who uh, round in the conference room with nursing staff, make decisions about patient care, and then communicate those to families later without any real collaboration with the family about the decisions and, and think if they have a nice communication style that they're doing family-centered care. And, um, you know, nobody objects to the concept um, because, well, I suppose someone might, but I haven't heard anyone actually <laughs> objecting to family-centered care as a principle, but what I find is that people um, just aren't willing to do some of those extra steps that truly meet the family-centered criteria mm -hmm. out of a, a misunderstanding. That was one of the reasons I kind of like to focus on that third um, concept because I think that... Um, that one is, uh, for clinicians, the fairly central one as to whether you're really partnering with families and respecting their expertise in the actual provision of care and in the clinical decisions that you're making. And we get pushback from nurses, too, actually. Yeah. Um, so uh, we cannot get the nurses on our pediatric medical unit to participate in rounds because it's too time consuming. And that's a fairly key concept in um, family-centered care is that you have a team, which includes physicians and nurses and parents, and if one member of the team, which is quite a key member. And the research actually shows people save time doing family-centered rounds um, <clears throat> because without everyone being at the table, you wind up with multiple conversations later on in the day, and not everyone hears every conversation, so there are missteps. Um, so I think that, that incorrect perception that it's too time-consuming to do it properly is a big barrier from 
clinicians. I have a, another question here from Jackie, um, and it's uh, to do again with this survey. Uh, so how diverse is the population that is served by the IWK, and how are the questions developed to capture uh, detailed feedback from the families that are not uh, typical and whose needs are not culturally or socially economically typical? Ah, that's a good point. And um, the survey is as diverse as our population is. So our, our population here in Nova Scotia is a bit diverse, but certainly not as diverse as others across the country would be serving. Um, actually, our second uh, largest language here is not French. Um, it's Arabic, actually. So um, you know, there, there are challenges. The survey only goes out in English. Um, and it probably, that's a very good point you're bringing up. It probably is not as diverse as it um, could or should be. Um, and, but it is a voluntary um, process. So um, I don't know what more to say about that. We don't target any particular grouping or any particular people other than the mail out is for um, those that are um, um, have been, have part of our survey process. It's the month prior, the discharge is up the month prior to when the survey goes out. We do target that group of people. So if you had been admitted here the month prior to our survey going out, and you had given permission to be contacted for quality improvement at a future point, anybody within that demographic would get the survey. Okay. I have another question here from Esther. How does the institution deal with liability issues? Do parents have to sign consent forms for all decisions they make? Yara is going to take that one. I was just literally downstairs signing off on a fluoride treatment. Um, and I was asking, why do I even have to sign for a basic fluoride treatment? They said, yes, I'm here. I'm here with my child. Make her better, whatever you need. And she said, literally, we we have to sign off on every single procedure. And we were discussing how I had had dentistry come in uh, while Maya was having her Fontan procedure so they could have a solid look at her uh, at her teeth and, and whatnot. And I said, I remember helping coordinate that as and ensuring that you guys were aware that the surgery was going to take place on the given date. And she said, yes, I can uh, tell you. Uh, I may not remember the details, but the nurses quite likely would not have let us even in the room if the paperwork had not been signed off. So there's definitely a lot of signature work happening here at the SBK. That would be for procedures, but as on, on rounds and decision making, there's no sign off. That's part of the care and treatment. So yeah, I, w I, would, I would clarify that as well. So for example, even when we were discussing medication changes and we've been in for multiple surgeries, no, there's not sign off on those. There is um, confirmation and clarification. I think um, in our earlier years, there sometimes were a bit more challenges in terms of not understanding what a new uh, medication coming through was. I would say in more recent years, it's been a lot stronger in terms of patient and family center care, in terms of clarifying and receiving um, endorsement from the family. So we are at the top of our hour here, um, uh, Darlene. So I don't know if anybody has any last comments they'd like to make. Um, myself, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. And if you do have any other questions for um, the IWK team um, and their Family Leadership Council, please, um, you can forward those questions to me and I'll send them along. I'll, I'll make the connections for you. Uh, and if you um, have any other comments or, or um, ideas uh, about, uh, you know, setting up uh, your own, if you're setting up a uh, your own council or making changes to your own council, I'm, I'm sure that the IWK team would be, uh, you know, open to uh, giving you some advice or or uh, showing you some of the work that they've done a little bit more. Anyways, uh, the, the uh, presentation will be um, posted on the Cassie Knowledge Exchange Network and uh, with probably early next week you'll find it up uh, and you'll receive uh, a link to, to that. But please, uh, I would invite you to uh, visit the Cassie Knowledge Exchange Network to look at all of our past uh, presentations and, uh, and webinar sessions. And uh, I would ask you also to join us December 20th is the Patient Safety Collaborative's next call.
Anything else, Darlene? Uh, no, no, thank, thank you, Lisa, Lisa, for uh, facilitating that. And just, uh, again, uh, we welcome anybody to our open collaborative, and we welcome um, any ideas that you would like to see presented as well. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend.